Let's start the next module where we'll talk about why do we care about Markov chains in the context of RBMs. So that's what we are going to do in this module. Okay, so recall our goals. Goal one was sample from P of X. Goal two was compute this intractable expectation, and of course both the goals are related. Okay. Uh, now suppose we set up a Markov chain X1, X2 up to whatever such that. What is the condition? The dash of this dash is equal to dash stationary distribution of this Markov chain is P of X, right? Okay. And further, it is easy to draw samples from this chain, right? There is no point in computing, uh, in constructing a chain such that at each point if I want to sample something from the chain is as hard as sampling from the original distribution. And that is what we saw in the setup, right? Because at every time step, I had to compute this mu 1, mu 2 and so on which was as hard as anything else, right? Because I have to do this very expensive matrix multiplication, right? So I should be able to set up a Markov chain such that it is easy to draw samples from that chain. And the stationary distribution of this chain is the distribution that I care about, P of X. And now because it is easy to draw from this chain, once I reach pi and once I start drawing samples from there, it would be easy for me to draw samples from the distribution that I care about. Does that statement make sense? irrespective of whether it is clear how to do it or not, at least the goal makes sense. How many of you are clear with what I just said? Please raise your hands high and above. Okay. So then it would mean if these conditions hold right, that if it is easy to sample from the chain and if the stationary distribution is P of X, then if we run this chain for a large number of time steps, then eventually we will start getting samples from P of X. Is that fine? Okay. And once we have that, once I reach a time step L at which I will somehow know that this is a stationary distribution. Then from that point I onwards I can take n samples because I know these n samples would come from the distribution that I care about which is P of X. So then I can approximate this expectation by this empirical expectation. Right? So that is what I am interested in doing. I am interested in setting a chain such that a stationary distribution is the distribution that I care about then run this chain for long enough so that I get samples from this chain and then use those samples to empirically compute the expectation that I want. Is that clear? Okay, fine. So now we will get into a more formal discussion and by formal I mean I will bring in some theorems, right? So if x0, x1 up to xt is an irreducible time homogeneous discrete, when I say discrete I mean discrete time as well as discrete space. Markov chain with the stationary distribution pi. So, so far nothing really ground breaking, we have know all this, this is, a, this is the Markov chain that we just saw. Then this theorem tells us that if I take samples from this chain, okay, then the expectation of a function f of x under the stationary distribution pi. I can get it by just doing this empirical estimate. So this empirical estimate will almost surely converge to the true expectation. Remember this is all asymptotically that means as n tends to infinity right? and we are never going to do n tends to infinity. But still is the statement of the theorem clear that if I have such a chain and if the stationary distribution of the chain is pi, then if I take a large number of samples from this chain and empirically compute the expectation, right? this is the same if you remember this quantity is the same as how I had estimated the average weight of the expected weight of the population, right? I had taken some t samples and I had just taken the average of the weight. That is exactly how I had done it empirically. So if we have samples from the distribution, I will empirically estimate the expectation and I can be almost sure that is going to converge to the true expectation if n tends to infinity for all x, capital X belonging to, what is this actually? The stylish x, what is it in our case? Sample space, what is it in our case? The answer is simple 0, 1 raised to n, right? But I am just writing it in, in because the sample space could be anyone, anything, right? It is not that it is only related to binary sample spaces, it could be anything. So for us, it is 0, 1 raised to n, but this could be any sample space. And x belongs to the stationary distribution, or x is, uh, x follows the stationary distribution pi. And this holds for any function 
which maps from the sample space to a real value, right? So in our case, the sample space is 0 to 1 raised to n. So any function which takes me from this sample space to r, the above statement holds true for r, right? In particular, it will hold true for whatever we had inside those two nasty looking expectations. Is that fine? Is that clear? So remember the origin of all this is those two expectations that we care about when we compute the gradient of the log likelihood with respect to wij. We had these two expectations and expectations are nothing but e with respect to a distribution of some function. So irrespective of what that function is, the above theorem will hold true, okay? Further, if the chain is aperiodic, then the probability of xt taking on the value small xt given some value of x0 approaches pi of x. What does this mean? So irrespective of where you started from, at time step t you are interested in finding on what is the probability that the random variable capital xt will take on some value, let us say small xt. That is the same as, so p of xt equal to xt irrespective of where you started because it is for all small xt's and for all small x naughts is the same as pi of x. That means it is the same as p of xt equal to xt, right? Where p, this p, I will just call it p1 is a stationary distribution, right? So I can run the chain for a long time and after a point I can be sure that even though the samples are coming from this distribution, they are actually coming from my stationary distribution. That is just a fancy way of saying the same thing that once you reach the stationary distribution, the samples are coming from the stationary distribution. Everyone is clear with this, okay? That is why as this again asymptotically, right? So as n tends to infinity, so that means it is, you start from the starting state, some point you reach the stationary distribution and now n tends to infinity, right? So now at that point, everything starts coming from the stationary distribution. So part A of the theorem essentially tells us that if we set up the chain such that its stationary distribution is the distribution that we care about, then we have a clean empirical way of approximating the expectation that we care about. Part 2 of the theorem, which is if further, tells us that if we set up the Markov chain such that its stationary distribution is the distribution that we care about, then after some point we will start getting samples from this distribution. Of course, part A and part B are related, right? Because we can approximate the expectation because the samples that we are getting are from the two distribution that we care about. And it does not matter where you start from because the theorem holds for all small x naught and small x t belonging to your sample space, okay? Is that fine? So now, given this setup, our task is cut off. We first need to decide what our Markov chain is going to be, okay? I will tell you what the Markov chain is going to be. To define a Markov chain, I should tell you what the transition matrix is because a Markov chain depends on the transition matrix, okay? I need to tell you that it is, I need to show that it is easy to sample from this chain. I do not need to do this expensive computations. Every element of the chain can come efficiently without any expensive computations. I need to show you that the stationary distribution of whatever chain I compute is going to be P of X. That's the distribution that we care about, okay? I need to show you that the chain is irreducible and aperiodic. Why? Because those are the two things which I had not defined and the theorem relies on those two properties, right? The chain has to be irreducible. It has to be aperiodic. I have not defined what these mean yet. I will define it soon and I will also give you an intuition for why whatever chain we set up is aperiodic and irreducible. So if I show you all of this, then we are done, right? Then I can get you samples from the distribution that you care about and then you can compute the expectation that you care about, okay? And for ease of notation, this capital X that I've been talking about, which was this random variable, I'm going to use X to denote the random variables that we had in the case of RBMs, which were these M visible units and N hidden variables. All of this collectively, I'm going to call as X. And so X actually belongs to 0, 0,1 raised to N plus M. And I'll refer to the individual elements of X as X1, X2. So these are not the elements of the chain. These are the dimensions of one particular random variable, right? So the random variable itself is of size N plus M. And these are the elements of that random variable. Is this change of notation clear to everyone? Otherwise, you'll not understand anything going forward.
okay so the club sum total of the visible and the hidden variables i'm called denoting it by capital x it contains all the hidden and the visible variables is that clear okay